All righty, so uh, after an adept change of plans, uh, we'll uh, try Skip's presentation at four, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, John Petrich, W7FU, I love that call sign, uh, <laughs> who's, who's going to give the first of two presentations about something that, that personally I think is really uh, important for our future, and that use of SDRs. Uh, there's now a lot of hardware out there that uh, will let you get directly up to microwave, and John is going to teach us a little bit about how to do that. So thanks, John. Could the peanut gallery please compose themselves back there? <laughs> so where's, where's John? There you are. Okay. <laughs> People are just wandering around. Thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about, uh, <laughs> I'm sort of unprepared here, but uh, SDR microwave ham radio hardware. And this level of, of gear is like the IF radio for the millimeter wave uh, radios that uh, we were just hearing about. So um, let's see, I'm assuming it's the up and down arrow, the normal. Oh, the space bar. Space bar? Right here. Okay. Good. There. Good. Well, the goal of this presentation is to have you consider a, a new approach to microwave radio. And what I'm thinking of is so many people these days are using their uh, FT8 71s and 17s and 57s and things like this. Uh, this is maybe a different way to do it. Uh, the outline of the presentation, oh, I can read here. Uh, review the architecture of modern microwave SDRs, block diagrams. Review the available SDR modules, just some photos of, uh, of boxes. And I'm going to give you some uh, examples of microwave rigs that I've built and used, and they've actually worked. <laughs> yeah, I swear. <laughs> yeah, I seem surprised. Well, I've been disappointed, and now I'm surprised. <laughs> well, this, this SDR stuff is foundational to modern telecommunications. We've heard you know, uh, rumors about that, we've seen it, we've, that sort of thing. Uh, largely developed for digital communications, these uh, broad, uh, high data, broadband, high data rate uh, uh, information systems. They're optimized for the lower microwave spectrum, I'm calling that the IF bands for the millimeter wave, and that's uh, you know, the usual, what you'd expect, uh, 12 gigahertz up to uh, six gigahertz. But, uh, they, and I'll say they offer low noise with a high signal-to-noise ratio, and I'll explain why. High degree of RF uh, linearity, exceptional frequency stability, and low phase noise. And this is the reason. Uh, here's a 64 QAM constellation diagram, a digital signal. And on the left is the good signal, on the right is the bad signal. And uh, this is what noise does to a... a data constellation, and then a, the uh, bit error rate goes way up, not down, it goes up. And it says noise here, but that could be atmospheric noise from a weak signal, that could be phase noise from a poopy uh, local oscillator. Uh, oh, a transmit IMD uh, will make uh, your constellation look like that. Um, so that's what's behind it, is digital communications, and they try to make it look like this. Um, the deal here with modern uh, SDRs, microwave SDRs, are the SDR digital hardware, and we heard a little bit about that from Barry, is integrated with analog RFIC transceivers. And I, I do mean transceivers. These little sub-postage stamp-sized ICs have transmitters and receivers and uh, A to D and D to A converters and all that kind of stuff in them. And they're all put together for uh, relatively seamless integration. Uh, basically what they offer then <coughs> is direct conversion uh, from the microwave frequencies back down to baseband. And if it's a transmitter, it's up from baseband to microwave. Direct conversion. Yeah, uh, yeah we've heard hints of this already this morning, this afternoon, yeah. Here is a block diagram, happens to be of an Edis product, but it's irrelevant. The, the point of it is this is a generic uh, advanced uh, 
microwave uh, SDR. This is an RFIC, analog devices. This one uh, happens to have only one transceiver. Uh, here, what's this? This is the transmitter, this is the receiver. And uh, there are others available, and some of which I'll show you that have up to four, and there's probably some that have more than four. Uh, this is the digital section here, uh, basically an FPGA that incorporates a, uh, on the baseband, could be up to 40 megahertz, um, <coughs> quadrature mixer, as I'm trying to think, IQ mixer, and then it outputs here to uh, uh, the data uh, connection to the computer is through USB. Uh, so the analog starts out here at your antenna, kind of comes in here, analog, analog, hits this digital to analog converter on the receiver, and it becomes digital, bam, and you're in the baseband here, doing all the, uh, well, not all of it, but some of the uh, DSP and into your computer. You know, I, I struggled with this for a long time in younger years. Where does the digital signal processing start? Well, you know. Be at the antenna now. Well, they're getting closer, I mean, physically. But in this block diagram, the digital signal processing starts right here. The, the FPGA, there's a certain level of digital signal processing, and they're pushing more of that that way as time goes by. Well, you're showing us a thing that's directly digitizing the RF with no down conversion whatsoever, not even to uh, intermediate. So what is the frequency range of that 93? 40 gigs. Oh, uh, well, this, okay, this chip, uh, the RF side is nominally 50 through 6 gigs. Uh, and then on the baseband output side, it's, uh, I think they say 56 in the specs, uh, zero. Uh, uh, baseband is frequencies around zero on up to some other number, and it's 56 here. The Lime SDR is somewhat similar to this, so you're going to get to that tomorrow. Right, we're going to hear more about this tomorrow, actually, from the Lime SDR. This is generic. <coughs> Okay, the fast A to D and D to A converter, that's the fast part here to get you to high frequencies, 40 and 50 uh, megahertz. The FPGA is for high-speed DSP, and you know, DSP starts in the FPGA. They're putting more DSP into ever bigger uh, FPGAs. That's like this flex radio for HF. They have a giant uh, FPGA, and so much of the digital signal processing w is in there. Uh, FPGA, which accounts for a lot of the uh, high performance of that particular radio, but the architecture is what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, and wide data uh, bandwidth coming out of the FPGA using USB 3. There's, um, well, uh, let's just say it's sufficient for uh, developmental purposes and certainly for ham radio. USB 2 has very limited bandwidth. Anyway, this is the architecture of the FPGA. I won't belabor it. I've kind of already covered it, uh, incidentally. The uh, quadrature mixer, the uh, interface with your uh, data link here, it's uh, USB 3, and uh, computer. Is this the new normal, these SDRs? Uh, we have uh, wide design flexibility in terms of the frequency coverage and modulation bandwidth. So my rigs and boards, which I'll show you here in a little bit, cover uh, six meters up through uh, 5760, uh, and that's it. It's a lot of bands. Um, the modulation bandwidth is just code. You can do TV, you can do uh, single sideband, um, you can do FT8, I suppose, too, even. Um, it offers high-performance analog and high-performance digital signal processing, and it simplifies system design, now we heard about systems a little earlier from Barry, with a wide band direct conversion SDR. So my multi, nine band, yeah, it's nine band SDR is in a little plastic Hammond box and I just carry it around and put on the right antenna and I'm on whatever band I want to be on. That's just as an example. Uh, this stuff's available to hams. Uh, it's targeted to, uh, you know, if you read the promotional literature, you know, developmental labs, uh, test and measurement applications, educational oriented modes, but it's easily repurposed, you know, for ham use. What's the difference between a, a lab technician and a ham? Not much. It assumes One gets paid, more. paid more, and maybe the technician's smarter, but <clears throat> assumes some, oh, 
Oh, yeah, I was going to say that that's all good news, and here's sort of the bad news. Uh, it assumes some independent learning. Uh, there aren't a lot of books written on this and, and very little literature on it, although I've tried to help that with my website, but that's another matter. And uh, a lot of experimentation um, because the roadmap is not clear. I'm going to go down the list of the hardware choices here, show you some pictures. Uh, Edis Research, uh, I'm sure so many of you have at least heard of them that in the Santa Clara area, Matt Edis. Uh, this is, I think is a Canadian company, Nuand Research, uh, Blade RF, Hack RF, which every, a lot of people have heard, it's inexpensive, and Lime SDR, which is uh, almost a new, new kid on the block in some sense, very sophisticated. We're going to hear about that. Here's a picture of the Edis uh, board that I happen to have a few of these. Um, I'm sure, uh, reason I'm doing this here. This happens to be only a single transceiver uh, uh, SDR. Here is the uh, input, and, I mean, receive and transmit. This is the RFIC right here. These are uh, control circuits. Uh, this is the FPGA, and this is the IC for the uh, USB 3. The rest of this stuff is management. You can drop a um, GPS 10 uh, megahertz, I almost said gigahertz, 10 megahertz block there, should you wish. Oh, and they make these. Oh, the one I have, I got it because I have fat fingers, three by five. You can buy these, though, at the, at the si uh, same size as a business card. Just can't get your fingers around the SMA uh, connections. <laughs> so you can see why. And I've actually, you know, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I've had troubles due to my own fault. I've actually been able to hack these traces and repair things and whatnot. So it's, uh, you know, the bigger is sometimes better. Here is the Blade RF. Oh, and I'll just say, yeah, I should probably tell you, this is the RF enclosure, nicely shielded and everything. This is the Altera, in this case, uh, FPGA, and then the USB 3. Oh, now this should be Lime SDR. I meant this to come first. Now this is just the reverse of those. This is the, uh, res uh, the antenna RF side. Uh, this is a, a f should be a four transceiver uh, IC, and you can see them arrayed. Uh, not quite sure what all of these mean. Uh, four receive ports, four transmitter ports, an Altera FPGA, and the um, data link. Hack RF comes in this cute little box, available at an inexpensive price. So I'm going to give some examples of the equipment I've built, and uh, you can see what I've done. Uh, this is the Edis 200 series SDR transceiver, which Michelle has in one of her ammo boxes uh, out there. In the, you can see it uh, in the uh, demonstration room there. Uh, it provides direct conversion from 50 to 6 gigahertz uh, and has all these things I mentioned earlier, good clocks. And you can uh, put an external master clock, which is just wonderful. These, these things are off about 8 kilohertz in my experience, and I put my uh, clock on there, and bam, I'm right on frequency. The uh, transmit RF output is, and I notice here, greater than 5 dB. I mean, that varies in amplitude across the spectrum, but you can count on 5 and uh, easily. And the receiver noise figure, actually, uh, it's probably, I, don't, I would say 3 dB, I'd say 2 plus, close to 3 dB across the spectrum. Not uh, uh, stellar, but certainly useful as a baseline rig. Um, here are some of the uh, typical specifications for this uh, Edis transceiver with the uh, uh, key features, you know, full duplex. You can go both transmitters and receivers operating simultaneously. This is a biggie, the USB 3 interface. This is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. You can write your own DSP right here. You don't need to know Python or C++ or anything else. Um, let's see, multiband. Um, the uh, A to D and D to A's are about 12 dB, and you multiply that by 6 plus a smidge, and you get what's 72 dB dynamic range. Um, this is the clock. 
uh, uh, which limits the uh, uh, instantaneous bandwidth if you, you know, be careful with um, aliasing, um, Nyquist, noise figure, they say 3 dB, and they claim in 78 dB uh, uh, dynamic range. Um, the result is an extremely flexible platform to develop SDRs. Well, you know what? Maybe some experts in this room. Uh, could somebody help me translate this number into ham talk? Some smart person in the audience. Error vector magnitude, 40 dB. So we're talking about something that's 1 in 6,000. Very negative percentage of that B. Uh, not 100, 0.01. That's very, very low for error vector magnitude for a wireless transmitter. I worked with that stuff back in. 2004 time frame, three and four percent. But it doesn't really translate to the ham radio world because how do you translate from digital to signal side? Not so easy. Well, I'm a little confused. If the inherent uh, transmitter has a stellar uh, IMD numbers, and then you, the rest of the system, uh, if, you know, the uh, total IMD out of the system is going to depend on the subsequent amplifiers. But anyway, that's, I. Yeah, yeah. Vector on that, and when you point to one of those dots, four clam points, within what percentage are you really pointing to that? Is oh. that a correct interpretation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Right. It's an 80s, they're a digital analog. You want a number that's the same as two steps. How off are they? Very small amount, then, Zach, is that right? So, and these are would be good numbers for hams? Oh, that's yeah. excellent. Oh, yeah. That's excellent for anybody, I think. Maybe Maybe you're you're side for your single side band won't be distorted. Yeah, you can solve that. Let's go on. <laughs> or my digital TV will look good. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. 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 Your TV will always win. <laughs> Anyway, I wondered. I I really don't know. I could dig into it, but I'd I'd, I'd forget what I learned. It's a pretty esoteric measure, and is it still in vogue? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm getting a little dated. So here's a couple uh, specs I put up there. I'll make make a couple of comments. Uh, this is uh, 2304, and that looks pretty clean to me. Yes. Right out of the box. You're looking at things that are 90 dB down. That's not you know not quite ninety, but it's it's clean enough. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. Not no, no. I just I just took a picture. Um, here is unfortunately, and we were talking a little earlier about VHF performance. Uh, here's the. This should be two meters, or no? Yeah, this is two meters. This is the wherever my center is. I think the second harmonic. If this is the fifth one over one, two, three, four, five. Oh, yeah, that's the second harmonic. I mean, it's just a nub in there, you can't see. But the third harmonic is only about oh, eight or 10 dB down from the uh, uh, carrier. So when I build rigs and things using this system, I put low pass filters on all my VHF and UHF equipment. Because uh, at the lower end, it generates lots of stuff. Um, now this here is the phase noise. And this is maybe isn't a, a great quantification, but, uh, this here is a 100 megahertz a comb oscillator. And then superimposed on it is, uh, this is at 5.8 gigahertz, uh, is the signal. And you can see, except at the very lowest end, uh, the phase noise is really pretty darn good. This CW signal. I know, I don't know. I, I forgot to put that on there. I wondered myself. But, you know, you look at it. You know, and it compares favorably to this comb generator. That's all I'm saying. It depends on how good this 100 megahertz oscillator and comb generator is, too. Let's hope it was good. And this is an IMD, and again, I, I don't have the horizontal scale here, but you can see the third order and stuff is just way low. So what do you need to make this stuff work? Well, you need the usual RF peripherals, and we went through that just a little bit earlier. You need a, a low noise amplifier. You need some sort of antenna changeover system. You need transmit power amplifiers. This is where the homebrew part comes in. Uh, sequencers, and uh, I recommend a master oscillator. Okay, what can you do with this stuff? Well, 
we'll skip through this pretty quickly on the test and measurement, but it's a signal source, synthesized frequency, you put a good clock on it and it's right on. Uh, <clears throat> and then the uh, output level is over five dBm, so it could be used to drive uh, double balanced mixers and things like that. <clears throat> Oh, you can use it as a narrow band uh, IF, uh, RF and IF spectrum analyzer uh, with an instantaneous bandwidth of about 25 megahertz or more, actually, if you want to push it. Uh, high sensitivity because it's got a preamplifier in it, so you're not limited by the uh, sensitivity of the spectrum analyzer mixer. You're limited by the sensitivity of the transceiver that you're using as a spectrum analyzer. Uh, and I've used it, and it's a little tedious, but as a point-to-point a uh, scalar network analyzer, like setting up an antenna, uh, doing the uh, return loss and that sort of thing. Here's where I like to spend most of my time. Uh, microwave direct conversion radio. Uh, this is applies only to the VHF and the lower microwave bands, the, maybe the, the DC end of the microwave bands, uh, 50 through 6 gigahertz. <laughs> And you know, here's uh, a slide, I, I'm not sure I, it, it's best for this audience, but for some audiences, it's important to explain direct conversion. Here's your whole transceiver, all one thing, whatever band. Then all you need for a high performance station is band specific amplifiers, band specific filters, uh, bands per band uh, equipment. You don't need uh, uh, another uh, um, uh, transverter in between. This is, uh, I can't remember, it's version one or something, but this is my rig, and I'm showing you, here's the board. This is a different board. It has two transceivers, one here and one here, and they all go to that little black thing. Um, Before you see your favorite, the edits, is there a reason that, is that just what you started? I favored it because uh, there was, it was uh, the first what appeared to be bulletproof one on the market. They, are, uh, they supported the GNU radio, which I love, and, uh, and I like green. <laughs> <laughs> but it was first, I, I wanted to get going, and I didn't want to fool around. Bulletproof. Um, oh, so the, and then we get to the rest of the radio. So for instance, following, um, I think, this is the receiver pathway, just briefly here. This is a, a receiver protection relay. It, it terminates the uh, receiver input uh, on transmit, and I've blown out receivers. That's why I had to hack a board before. Uh, without that protection, and I was running like a few watts on 5760, as I recall. Then um, in the receive, then this goes to the antenna. But in a receive pathway, because this is a pretty much a wide open front end, I have a, a big band stop filter from I noticed some nods from many circuits that cuts out the FM broadcast band in our area. We have a, we're blessed with an RF rich environment. Uh, so it, it basically knocks out a, a large source of uh, RF energy on the input of the receiver and then goes around and around and uh, comes out here. Uh, I have a little transmit amplifier I put in there, broadband cover, you know, from many circuits. And this is the transmit and receive relay, which I have integrated in the same package. Again, just an example of all these peripherals you kind of need to make uh, this work. Now there's more, but this is kind of the basic. And this is the latest, almost the latest incarnation. This is on, should be 5760, yeah, 5760. This is one of those uh, back, one of those little three to four watt modules we were talking about a few years ago on 5760. Uh, here's one of, uh, Kent's antennas, and uh, you can tell I'm a CW operator. Oh, here, it has integrated and built in uh, keyer. Uh, there's a beacon button on the new one, um, that kind of stuff. And lights, I got LEDs that light up. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, and on one point, which we'll come to in a minute, I, I'm having fun here. <clears throat> this is like a old fashioned switchboard, you know, you take all the wires off and there's a bunch of SMA connectors. Exactly. So, uh, what about microwave IF radios? And that's kind of where I'm personally going. 
uh, this, you can ca call this double conversion architecture if you consider uh, direct conversion, your know, first conversion. Upper microwave and millimeter bands. Uh, so an IF radio for those. You have flexible IF choices. Pick a frequency, it's yours. You know, you're not stuck with a 10 meter IF or a two meter IF or 432 IF. You can have an IF in any frequency. And I'll show some examples of that actually. And it'll accept, given the data bandwidth capability of these uh, transceivers, any modulation that you want, TV, digital TV, maybe the AMSAT satellite. I've done this with, um, I think it's 11 or 12 uh, megahertz wide uh, data constellations, and it works. This is one example of 144 megahertz IF, uh, the same old rig. Uh, this is on 24 gigahertz. This is my 24 gigahertz rig. It's a uh, DB6NT transverter. Um, so it's real simple. This could be an FT817 if you wanted. You know, just do that. So a transmitter goes in the transmit, receive goes in the receive, and the antenna terminal, and it just internally switches. Now here's a 10 gigahertz transverter. You know, these aren't the latest slides. Um, this uses, but that's fine. This uses a 1.3 gigahertz IF. So what happens here is, um, <clears throat> let's see, where am I? Oh, uh, the IF here, this is the IF coming out of the uh, mixer. And this is 1.3 gigahertz uh, local oscillator signal, which goes in, here and becomes oh here amplified and multiplied to nine point whatever it is. And you add that with one point three and you get ten point three six eight one. So uh, I'm able to use both of the transceivers one way or another in this uh, from this SDR board to make a rather conventional uh, ten gigahertz mixer transceiver. Uh, with a 1.3 gigahertz IF. And this is uh, it um, in the field, just as making a contact, a uh, rover contact. Hmm, damn. Well, I have another photograph of uh, another rig that uses a five gigahertz IF. And it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's not as clean on the output. There's some, some spurs and things, but that isn't in this deck. So I'm um, just giving an example. You can use it as an IF radio at 144, an uh, IF radio and local oscillator at 1.3 gigahertz, and an IF radio and local oscillator at 5 gigahertz. You know, I split the frequencies up a little bit, and they all add up to 10.3681. Well, no, I saw you shaking your head. Oh, yeah, okay, that's good. Okay, I think this should be the end. I don't even know what time it is. Yeah, down the slippery slope. You know, like I said, a lot of this stuff uh, takes a lot of individual learning, and there's stuff written. And I'm not saying this is the best stuff, but this is one place to find some stuff. My website, whiskey7foxuniform.com. Oh, and I should say, too, before I conclude and throw it open to questions or step down, um, in your proceedings, uh, the slides and the narrative that I submitted, somehow all didn't get uh, done the, uh, completely. So the, the complete slide deck for both talks and the narrative that associated with this are all have been revised and are on my website. You look on publications or whatever it is, presentations and publications, go to the bottom and uh, click on MUD18 and all that stuff's there. Well, okay, hope you're stimulated. Thank a local ham for all of his help. And uh, I'm open for questions, criticisms, or anything else. We're actually using a bunch of this stuff in a professional uh, environment. We have a hack RF. John, I'd be amazed that people couldn't hear me. <laughs> but mostly they don't want to hear me. Oh, okay. Uh, we use a hack RF at, uh, we upconvert it, we take it up to 8 gigahertz, 7 gigahertz, and we simulate deep space signals with it. We look at IF of the deep space stuff with a bunch of uh, B210s. We had four of them put together and did a record breaking. So these things are everywhere. Even my students are running around. I don't own a hack RF yet, but like five of my students have them, and they say, oh, here, you can use mine. And they reach <laughs> in and they pull it out, and they, they know all about it and everything. So 
uh, yeah, these are these are a lot of fun. And I, it's interesting the choice you made and the concept of it as a millimeter wave IF, a very flexible box to do that kind of thing. You know, that, that starts to move your image frequencies pretty far out of band of your uh, bandpass of your amplifier. And pretty so soon your antenna is your bandpass filter. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you use high side injection, uh, Barry. <laughs> high side, everyone hear that again? High side injection. Well, I'm good. Uh, I was gonna, uh, Michelle, I'll, just a second, I'm gonna ask a question. Well, why don't you speak, Michelle, I'll try to remember what my question was. Some, some of these are pretty expensive. The USRP, because it's really, really nice, um, you have a, a more bits that you're, um, that you're measuring with, and the phase noise is really good, so they can be thousands of dollars. The other ones that he talked about are in the three-digit range, uh, but some of them are kind of the high digit, especially the new Blade RF, which was released recently. Um, there is a way to get into this, uh, to play around with SDR and GNU Radio, which is free, uh, and it's called an RTL SDR, and they're about 30 bucks. It's receive only, but <coughs> you can start playing around with all of this for $30. RTLSDR.org or com. Yeah, if you go to RTLSDR.com, you can find them. You can also get them all on eBay, and that'll they're, get you up and running. They're 20 bucks on Amazon. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Well, although these are the good ones. The, there are $10 ones, but they don't work very well. You know, uh, Michelle, I want to echo that uh, about the RTL and just say one thing interesting. We have a, uh, I was telling some people, we have a, a garage, not a garage band, a garage build group for microwave gear. And we're working in the garage. Well, somebody forgot their spectrum analyzer. So one of the, the locals whipped out their RTL dongle, put it into her, her computer, uh, fired up SDR sharp, and they were able to beta test a 1296 uh, transceiver using just that thing. Uh, it's uh, Maybe not, it can't quantify things very well, but qualify, uh, quali qualitatively see whether things are working or not. So the fun thing was a guy came from JPL and he had a hack RF, and my buddy Bob, who's been buying the RTLs forever, he gives them to students. He says, here, here, learn about an SDR, and he gives them a hack, one of the uh, sticks, the dongles, and off they go with it. Guy from JPL had never seen the twenty dollar SDR, <laughs> and so Bob says, "Well, here, have one." And he gives it to him, shows up, and install it. The guy's like, "Wow!" Why did he do it? Well, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> do I still have a little time? Yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to comment further upon all this drama here. Um, the the RTL SDR is not. No, it's good. It's great. Well, and we all started with them. But it's not what I just presented. It uh, doesn't have an FPGA or any of that kind of stuff. It's, it's like the old, um, oh shit, those old through, through hole, uh, oh man. No, hack, not soft hack. Rock. Soft rock. It's a soft rock, uh, integrated circuit soft rock. No problem, but it's not this. Right. And then, you know, we're all, I'm all enthusiastic. I love this stuff, great numbers. But, you can't just do it. You can't buy the hardware. You just don't down uh, software. You don't download it from the internet. You got to write it, and that's where GNU Radio comes in, and and some sort of some of the pain surrounding this implementing this kind of equipment is you have to work at getting the software to do it for you. So that's about all I can think of, unless somebody has a question. <laughs> way, and way in the back, and then the fellow with the fuzzy hair. The, well, I met the good-looking guy are, with the fuzzy hair. Are there any, <laughs> are there any ham radio users groups that are actually starting to focus on these? I'm starting to do this myself, and I'm finding yeah. that it's really hard to. Yeah, talk to me. Put the, oh, okay, talk to you. Yeah, I think it's because about yeah, because I have a hack RF and I have an Edis B210. By the way, I want to point this out. If you buy the prototype board, the white one instead of the green one, they're starting to go on eBay for like 300 bucks. So versus 1100, 800, or 1100, they're 300, and they're, you can find those. Okay, well, uh, let's see. That's true. I know that, and thank you. Uh, and Michelle, did you want to say anything in response, just in general, for the benefit of the audience? There's a lot of hams that are using mm -hmm. SDRs and doing a wide variety of cool things. So just come talk to me, and I'll talk your ear off about about them. Now, the good-looking guy with the fuzzy hair and the purple shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, don't forget the comment you wanted to make. That's all. My well, that was, oh, well, uh, thank you. Well, that was a, the, uh, the disclaimer about the software. This is oh. great hardware. You, you can see how you can put it together, but you got to make it work with learning some software, unfortunately. Cool. Well, the horsepower is Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it, there's a big difference there. Uh, the DSP is distributed between the FPGA and the computer. More and more, the DSP is heavily weighted in the FPGA. It's, but it's. Yes, yes. That's a total difference. Yes, yes. That's it? I see. Most of the stuff that's currently in the, F in the FPGA is a bunch of the stuff that they're just abstracting away from the user. So it's the, the downsampling and the decimation and a lot of the filtering just to make it so that when you say, I want 10 megahertz of spectrum, in the PC you get 10 megahertz of spectrum and you don't have to worry about all the stuff that went on between the ADC and, and that USB interface. Uh, you still need a lot of heavy horsepower in the PC to do narrowband FM or single sideband or whatever, I guess, Heavy-duty DSP is relative, right? Depends on what you're doing. But uh, you still have to run GNU Radio, say, to get some kind of effect out of it. So there's still a learning curve, even for simple stuff, uh, just to get GNU Radio to you know, behave properly. Um, the quality of what's between the ADC and the, and the USB uh, is a lot different between, say, an Edis product and an RTL SDR. And, I, and a nice happy middle ground I also mentioned is the FunCube dongle uh, Pro Plus. Um, it's it's uh, another receive only device um, from Howard. Uh, get his call sign, uh, but it's it, that's another fantastic, uh, much higher performing. It's another one of these that looks like an RTL SDR, uh, but has a much better RF front end and filtering built into it. Um, so that's another good place to get started. So, thank you. Any other questions?